So welcome to Unit 12, Module 66, Anxiety Disorders, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. These slides align with Myers Psychology for the AP course, third edition. And this is a pretty long module. <laughs> there are four learning targets, contrast, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and phobias. Describe obsessive compulsive disorder, called OCD. Describe post-traumatic stress disorder, often called PTSD, and examine how conditioning, cognition, and biology contribute to the feelings and thoughts that mark anxiety disorders, OCD, and PTSD. So what are anxiety disorders? Psychological disorders characterized by distressing persistent anxiety or maladaptive behaviors that reduce anxiety. Four anxiety disorders will be covered in this module. Social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, phobia, and agoraphobia. So what is social anxiety disorder? We've probably heard this term before. It is intense fear and avoidance of social situations. It used to be called social phobia. People with social anxiety disorder become extremely anxious in social settings where others might judge them such as at parties, class presentations, or even things like eating in public. To stave off those anx anxious thoughts and feelings, um, they might avoid going anywhere at all if they have such anxiety. Generalized anxiety disorder is an anxiety in which, disorder in which a person just continually feels tense, apprehensive, and in a sort of state of autonomic nervous system arousal. So out of control, agitated feelings can suggest the presence of generalized anxiety disorder. This is marked by excessive and uncontrollable worry that persists for six months or more. People with this condition and two thirds of the people with this condition are women continually worry and they're often jittery, agitated and sleep deprived. So what are some characteristics of generalized anxiety disorder? The person usually cannot identify and therefore relieve the tensions caused. Right? So to use Freud's term, the, the anxiety that they're feeling is sort of free floating. It's not really linked to any sort of specific threat or stressor in the environment. It's just there. There's just a constant feeling of anxiety. Uh, it's often accompanied by depressed mood, but even without the depression, it can be very disabling for a person. And it may lead to physical problems such as high blood pressure, sleep disturbances, which can then have huge effects on mental health in general, um, and other issues. Panic disorder is an anxiety disorder marked by unpredictable minutes long episodes of intense dread panic attacks in which a person might experience terror and accompanying chest pain, choking or other frightening sensation. It's then often followed by worry over the next attack. So if you go through having a panic attack, then you're worried often about having another one because you don't want to have one. For the 3% of people with panic disorder, Panic, dis panic attacks are recurrent. They, they kind of can be conceptualized as anxiety tornadoes. It strikes suddenly, wreak havoc, and disappear, but they're not forgotten by the person who have, has them. So what does a panic attack feel like? So this golfer um, experienced what he later learned were panic attacks during an important tournament. His thumping heartbeat and shortness of breath led him to think that he was having a heart attack. That's what a lot of people often think. They're having a heart attack when it turns out it's actually a panic attack. So hospital tests revealed that his symptoms were not related to physical illness and he recovered and went on to win a lot of money. <laughs> and he became an inspiration to others struggling with panic uh, disorder. After several panic attacks, people might avoid the situation where the panic might strike. If their fear is intense enough, people can actually develop what is called agoraphobia, a fear or avoidance of public situations from which escape might be difficult. Given such fear, people may avoid being outside the home, in a crowd, or in an elevator. Now, what is a phobia? What does that term mean within psychology? It's an anxiety disorder marked by a persistent, irrational fear and avoidance of a specific object, activity, or situation. So it's an irrational fear that leads to an avoidance of a specific activity, object, situation. You see the spider there. That's one that a lot of people, arachnophobia, a lot of people have a bit of a fear of spiders. Now, whether it actually becomes a true phobia for most people, it doesn't, but for some people it does. So what are some of the most common specific phobias? And they can focus on things like animals, insects, heights, blood, or closed spaces. You can see fear of heights, um, 
is uh, the percent, a lot of people have a fear of heights. I do not at all. Um, <laughs> I love being up on tall buildings or up in airplanes. I love being up high. Um, I have a little bit more of the fear of enclosed spaces like claustrophobia, being stuck in an elevator with a bunch of people. Um, I wouldn't say it's a phobia though. Um, but these are some different things that actually are common phobias for people to have. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is a disorder characterized by unwanted repetitive thoughts. Those are called the obsessions, actions. The compulsions are both. So obsessive thoughts are unwanted and so repetitive that it seems like they will never go away. And then the compulsions, the compulsive behaviors are often the responses to those obsessive thoughts. So what are some common obsessions and compulsions? So common obsessions for sure, dirt, germs, toxins, something bad happening, having a fire, a death, illness, or having some um, obsessive thoughts about symmetry, order, or exactness, okay? The compulsions that people, the behaviors that people exhibit are things like excessive hand washing, brushing teeth, grooming, bathing, um, in and out of a door, checking door locks, checking car brakes, checking your homework over and over again, those kind of things. Rituals and fussy behaviors cross the fine line between normality and disorder when they persistently interfere with everyday living and cause distress. So I definitely can see myself. I have, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. Um, I like things to be in order. I like symmetry. Um, and I, you know, I always like to check to make sure the door's locked, but it, I don't have OCD because it doesn't persistently interfere with my everyday functioning. So what is the difference between a normal behavior and one suggesting OCD? So normal, checking that you lock the door is normal. Checking it 10 times is not. Washing your hands thoroughly is normal. Washing it so your skin becomes raw is not. Organizing your markers and pens is in rainbow order is normal. I might do that. Not being able to use a pen unless it is in rainbow order is not. So thriving with OCD. So Justin Timberlake has openly discuss, discussed his OCD and he says that support from his family and having a sense of humor about it has helped him cope with the challenges of having OCD. So what other disorders are classified as OCD related disorders in the DSM-5? So hoarding disorder, you know, clutter in one space with acquired possessions one can't let go. So having to keep hold of so many things and not being able to get, get rid of them. Body dysmorphic disorder. So preoccup preoccupation with your body and feeling like you have defects and you need to get them fixed. Um, not always needing to get them fixed, but just being preoccupied with um, your perceived body defect defects. Trichotillomania, which is um, obsessive hair pulling. Um, and then there's also excessive skin pink picking is related to OCD as well. So what is PTSD? It's a disorder characterized by haunting memories, nightmares, hypervigilance, social withdrawal, jumpy anxiety, numbness, or feeling, and or insomnia that lingers for weeks, for four weeks or more after a traumatic experience. We often think about it in relation to um, soldiers that have gone to war, but that is not the only that are, those are not the only people that experience PTSD. Typical symptoms include recurring haunting memories and nightmares, laser-focused attention to possible threats, social withdrawal, jumpy anxiety, and trouble sleeping. So what treatments do we have for PTSD? So many military war veterans participate in an intensive recovery program using deep breathing, massage, and group and individual discussion techniques to treat PTSD. So why do some develop PTSD after a traumatic event? So about half of us experience at least one traumatic event in our lifetime, yet five to 10% of people develop PTSD and others don't. So one factor that might explain why some people develop PTSD and others don't is the amount of trauma-related emotional distress. The higher the distress, such as the level of physical torture suffered by prisoners of war, the greater the risk of post-traumatic symptoms. Some people may have a more sensitive emotion processing limbic system. Think back to our biological basis of behavior modules that flood their body with stress hormones, which explains why PTSD may coexist with another disorder. Twins compared with non-twin siblings more commonly share PTSD cognitive risk factors. So there seems to be something, um, a genetic linkage there as well. And the odds of experiencing PTSD after a traumatic event are about two times higher for women than for men. So how does conditioning impact 
impact anxiety disorders, OCD, and PTSD. Anxious or traumatized people learn to associate their anxiety with certain cues. 58% of those with social anxiety disorder develop the disorder following a traumatic event. Anxiety or an anxiety-related disorder is more likely to develop when bad events happen unpredictably and uncontrollably. So stimulus generalization, let's think back to module 26, okay? Remember back to that. In classical conditioning, stimulus generalization is the tendency, so we're thinking about learning, classical conditioning, Pavlov's dogs, um, is the tendency once a response has been conditioned for stimuli similar to the conditioned stimulus to elicit similar responses, right? Um, in operant conditioning, stimulus generalization occurs when responses learned in one situation occur in other similar situations, okay? How is that related to PCSD? PTSD, sorry. Stimulus generalization occurs when a person experiences a fearful event and later develops a fear of similar events. Um, so if you have some, a situation in which you're fearful because you um, experienced something and in that situation there was a really loud noise that happened and then you start just fearing any sort of situation that has a loud event, a loud noise, that would be a generalization. Or if a child is bit by a dog, the fear associated with that bite may develop into a fear of all dogs. So what is reinforcement and how does it help explain anxiety, OCD, and PTSD? Again, thinking back to our learning modules, module 27 in operant conditioning, reinforcement is any event that strengthens the behavior it follows. Reinforcement helps maintain learned fears and anxieties. Anything that enables us to avoid or escape a feared situation can reinforce maladaptive behaviors. Fearing a panic attack, we may decide not to leave the house. Reinforced by a calmer feeling, we're likely to repeat that behavior in, our, in the future. If washing our hands relieves our feelings of anxiety, we may wash our hands again and again and again when those feelings return. So how about cognition? Cognition, you know, our thoughts, memories, interpretations, and expectations also influence our feelings of anxiety, of course. Our past experiences shape our expectations and influence our interpretations and reactions. Whether we interpret the creaky sound simply as the wind or as a possible knife-wielding attacker determines whether or not we panic. So what research has been conducted in this area? So Susan Medica, experimented with six monkeys raised in the wild who are all strongly fearful of snakes and their lab raised offspring who were not afraid of snakes. After repeatedly observing their parents or peers refusing to reach for food in the presence of snakes, the younger monkeys developed a similarly strong fear of snakes. When the monkeys were tested three months later, their learned fear persisted. Now, what about the genetic influence on anxiety, OCD and PTSD? One research team identified 17 gene variations associated with typical anxiety disorder symptoms. Other teams have found genes associated specifically with OCD. If one identical twin has an anxiety disorder, the other is also at risk. Even when raised separately, identical twins may develop similar phobias. Some genes influence disorders by regulating brain levels of neurotransmitters. These include serotonin, which influence sleep, mood, and attending to threats. And genes also regulate the level of glutamate, which heightens activity in the brain's alarm centers. So our experiences change our brain, paving new pathways. Trauma, fear learning, traumatic fear learning experiences can leave tracks in the brain, creating sort of fear circuits within the amygdala. These fear pathways create easy inroads for more fear experiences. So how are brain structures involved? Brain scans of people with OCD reveal elevated activity in the anterior, anterior cingulate cortex during behaviors such as compulsive hand washing, checking things, ordering, or hoarding. Um, the anterior cingulate cortex is a brain region that monitors our actions and checks for errors. It seems especially to be overactive, hyperactive in these people. So how does biology drive fears? The bio Logical perspective helps us understand why most people have more fear of heights than does Alex Honnold, shown here. I said, I would, this is one I don't have. I, I don't have a fear of heights. Um, shown at the right in 2017, although I wouldn't do this, becoming the first person to free solo climb, no safety ropes uh, at Yosemite National Park. Okay, if you haven't, Yosemite is an amazing place. Okay, 
How does natural selection underlie our fears? We seem biologically prepared to fear threats faced by our ancestors. Our phobias focus on specific fears such as spiders, snakes, and other animals, enclosed spaces and heights, storm and darkness. So they sort of make sense from an evolutionary perspective. Those fearless about these occasional threats were less likely to survive and leave descendants. Even in Britain, with only one poisonous snake, people often fear snakes. Okay, so back to the learning targets. Anxious feelings and behaviors are classified as an anxiety disorder when they form a pattern of distressing persistent anxiety or maladaptive behaviors that reduce anxiety. People with generalized anxiety disorder feel persistently and uncontrollably tense and apprehensive for no apparent reason. In the more extreme panic disorder, anxiety escalates into periodic episodes of intense dread. Intense dread is what you feel during a panic disorder. Those with a phobia may be irrationally afraid of a specific object, activity, or situation. Enclosed spaces, um, being up high, fear of heights, spiders, those kind of things are common phobias. So OCD is persistent and repetitive thoughts, which are called the obsessions, and behaviors, the compulsions, are what characterize OCD. PTSD includes haunting memories, nightmares, social withdrawal, jumpy anxiety, and sleep problems following some traumatic experience. So through conditioning, anxious or traumatized people may learn to associate their anxiety with certain cues. Stimulus generalization occurs when someone experiences a fear event and then they generalize. They later develop a fear of similar events. Reinforcement helps maintain learned fears and anxieties. Cognition can influence our expectations and our interpretation of and reaction to stimuli. We may learn some fears by observing others' fears, okay? So people with anxiety disorders tend to be hyper vigilant and attend more to threatening stimuli more often interpret ambiguous stimuli as threatening and remember threatening events. And finally, our biology plays a role. Genetic predispositions for high levels of emotional reaction, emotional reactivity and neurotransmitter production make us vulnerable to disorder, as do epigenetic marks. Abnormal responses in the brain's fear circuits can create inroads for disorder. Natural selection, um, may have prepared us, and evolution may have prepared us to fear threats our ancestors faced. So that may, that's a, you know, an explanation for why we have some of these fears. That is all. Thank you for listening. Take care.